Hello, everybody. We're very excited to introduce to, uh, to you our new partner, AGL, and talk about uh, how to make your business profitable. Uh, this crisis uh, taught us that we must not only concentrate on making more revenue or making uh, more or managing more units, but it's also that we have to be profitable in order to have a financial cushion uh, for the future. So if, our, if your company doesn't make money, we'll you know, be able to scale and grow in the long term and will compromise the future of the business. So that's why we are here. Um, we will speak with Simon Lehman, uh, CEO and co-founder of AGL, about their new service. It's called APS, uh, which is a revenue management consulting service. And at the end of the webinar, we'll have a 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, so please, Simon, let's start. Can you tell us uh, what's APS? What differences does it have from with other products and how APS can help property managers? Absolutely. First of all, Manuel, thank you so much for the introduction. It's great to be here today. We're very uh, honored to be able to form this partnership together with Avantio, one of the leading PMSs in the vacation rental industry. We have one thing in common. We both start with A. That's already a great start for a partnership. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of AGL Consulting, as uh, Manuel said, and we are very enthusiastic about profitability. And we raised that flag pre-COVID already saying, guys, we've seen so much capital flowing into the vacation rental market, and we have seen very little profitability, especially with scalable business. And we felt we need to start talking about profitability far more in our industry. I think COVID and the downturn that we had in terms of demand has shown us how vulnerable we are in terms of demand gen and profitability overall. And you know, the word oxygen, we are very familiar with now with COVID because we are, we are struggling and oxygen is important for survival. And we, we equal oxygen with, with profitability in the vacation rental industry. So we need oxygen to survive. And we don't just need revenue. Revenue is a result thereof in how we price our units, but profitability comes first. So we need to be able to run a profitable business in order uh, to be sustainable as a property manager in our industry. So we came up with a product called APS, it's called the AGL Profitability Solution, uh, which is a product of AGL Consulting that we have developed together with Ezio Albanese, who is our uh, uh, architect of this algorithm that we have developed uh, it's a, that helps us to understand the cost allocation. Now, uh, one thing we want to say here very provocatively is that we felt the revenue management approach in vacation rental industry is broken. And why do we say that? Because we have adopted um, practices from the hotel and the airline industry where hotels and airlines have about 80% fixed costs of costs they can't reduce because they're there, because a the hotel is there, the staff are there. Uh, in, no matter how many uh, beds are filled, they have high fixed costs. Airlines are the same. If an airplane flies from A to B, it has fuel, it has a crew, it has ground handling costs, it has landing fees. These are fixed. They're not variable. They don't depend on the number of passengers on that plane. So airlines have about 80% variable costs and only 20% is is a variable is not fixed. So 20% is variable. So that means, you know, every additional beta hotel can fill or every additional passenger an airline can sell, it is a direct contribution to the gross margin. In vacation rental, it's totally the opposite. And this is what APS is all about. We're looking at cost in order to look, uh, see that we're becoming profitable. And then we see how much we can sell actually the, the unit for. So we're not competing directly with the revenue management systems because they give us a price recommendation through their own technology. But we need to understand the profitability of a, of a property manager is unit on a unit level and on a booking level. Because what we have not understood is that each booking that is triggered on a revenue share basis with an owner triggers 70% cost for the owner and then triggers costs for cleaning, then triggers costs for a key handling uh, and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So we have about the fixed variable cost ratio in vacation rental is actually opposite 
of what airlines and hotels are doing. And this is why we're saying, guys, think about profitability first, think about your cost. And then based on that, we can de derive a profitable uh, business and, and set the prices accordingly. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And that takes us into the nicely into the first tip uh, of the day, which is to, as you said, take into account the fixed and the variable costs. So what are the fixed and the variable costs that should be taken into consideration and that you analyze in APS? And how does that look at both a business level and uh, an individual unit or, or property level? Absolutely, Kyle. So there it's very important that we start differentiating what is fixed, what, what are costs that I have, regardless of a booking or not. Costs that I constantly have, my accountant, my marketing team, my, my GNA, this channel administration costs, they're fixed costs. My, re my office rent, if I have one, uh, my car that I might be driving is fixed. So I have some fixed costs. These are need to be identified. They're normally going into your administration costs. If I'm a larger business, I might even have a HR manager of a HR team. And so that's that's fixed. I have those, right? And some companies are even having fixed rents, uh, which are guaranteed rents to own. So you need to, that's a fixed cost, obviously, as well, which we have seen the result with the master lease guys in the US in COVID, what happened when you have fixed rents, because that is debt on your balance sheet. Then you have the variable costs, and the variable costs are associated with the actual property, with the unit in itself. If it's booked, it triggers variable costs. It triggers a payment to the owner. It triggers a commission to the OTA, because if there is no booking, you don't need to pay the OTA. If there is no booking, you don't need to pay your channels. Uh, um, you might have marketing costs, which are fixed, but then they co also can turn into variable in, in case it triggers a booking. So cost allocation between variable and fix is one of the challenges about APS, but we help, our algorithm helps and our structure helps for you to understand what are my fixed costs in my operation and what is my, uh, what is my variable cost. And this is then giving us the visibility to see profitability down on a booking level and on a unit level. The allocation in itself is very challenging and needs to be done at least once a year that you say, okay, these are my fixed costs, these are my variable costs. And once you have defined percentages, you know, a, a company with 100 to 200 units can run that through the entire year and then readjust it again, probably in a new year, depending how many units you have gained or how many units you might have lost, you need to maybe uh, change your allocation on fixed and variable costs again. Fantastic. Let's, let's go to the second, second tip. Um, what's so important to measure your customer acquisition cost and how to calculate them? Absolutely, Manuel. So we even expand on that. For us, there's two KPIs related to customers. All of us know in the vacation rental industry, what makes our conversation always challenging, internal or external, we have two customers, right? And that's not always easy in the teams. It's also not easy with, with the stakeholders because both of them feel equally important. And one thing I want to urge here to the industry, make sure, please, you're taking a balanced approach. Not an owner-heavy approach, but also not a guest-heavy approach. Take a balanced approach. That's something that we're preaching like crazy because I still believe there's many companies who have not understood how to be balanced. So that's point number one. Point number two, we have acquisition costs for both. So we have customer acquisition costs, which we call in our financial terms, the CAC. And then we have the property acquisition costs, which is the PAC. And they're equally important for you to know because that will help you to understand how much cost or, or actually revenue you can generate by getting new customers on. And when you look at the customer acquisition costs first, it's not trivial just to say, well, my customer acquisition costs are simply the commissions I pay to the OTAs, for example, or my customer acquisition costs are simply my search engine marketing costs that I'm paying to Google. No. My customer acquisition cost starts with the sales team. Everything that is related to creating a guest coming to book needs to be allocated to the customer acquisition cost. 
that means your your picture of how you def derive your distribution strategy might fundamentally change because you realize that maybe a third party distribution is actually a lot more expensive than what you thought and not just adding commission from an OTA, but you need to add personnel that work on that. You have maybe a call center that handles the guest inquiries. So you need to allocate these costs to make sure you calculate the true cost of you to gain one guest to your property. You have a website, you have a web designer who updates that. So that's all costs you need to allocate to the booking. On the property acquisition cost, it's exactly the same. So when we go out and consult companies and say, what, what does it cost you to add one more unit to your, to your business? They will say, well, I have one contractor. He costs me 2,000 euro plus commission. That's my cost. And say, no, that's not your cost. That's a part of your cost. But what, it, what you also have, you have administration work to create the content, take the photos, upload the picture, get it to the channels. That's additional cost that is generated by the property acquisition cost. Plus... And that's the most important KPI next to these two is what is your churn? And this is something we all need to be mindful because churn means how many properties you lose while how many properties you gain. And in that sense, we talk about net churn. Net churn means how many booking, how many properties you have gained within a period of time and how many properties have you lost in a period of time. That minus the other gives you a net churn rate. So let's say you have 100 units, you've gained 10 in a year, and you've lost eight. So you have a positive churn of 2%. And that needs to be thought about when you look at your property acquisition cost, because churn creates cost because you need to get more contracts while you're losing the others. So you can't just look at your gained contracts, you have to look at your lost contracts because they, they drive costs. So these are high level ways in how we attribute property acquisition costs and customer acquisition costs. Fantastic. Simon, um, what about direct bookings versus portal bookings? Um, my guess is that to know exactly your acquisition costs is very important in order to find the right balance. That's, that's my guess. What's, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something that we're very adamant about. You know, I'm I'm one of these dinosaurs that come from a very large property management company where, you know, the large property management companies, because they built brands in the past, they printed catalogs like crazy. They had strong brands and they were doing 60 to 70 percent direct business and they were taken over by the OTAs just for, you know, it was for the, their calculation. It was cheaper. To, why should I pay Google X if I get a, a, an OTA booking on the other? But what we have lost is we have not thought about what is my repeat rate because a direct customer is cheaper to repeat than, than if not. So we need to take that into consideration. Repeat rates have come down from as high as 30, 40 percent repeat rates down to 10 percent. That all triggers additional costs because we need to gain more new guests to come to our properties. While in the past we had 40 percent to draw back on, just send them an email, convert them back in a booking is obviously very is a lot cheaper. So if you ask me a healthy mix, Manuel, in, in, in today's distribution world, if you're a mid-sized property management company, you should have at least 50 percent direct and 50% indirect business. You need to balance it. You need to have eggs in several different baskets. And one thing that you need to be extremely mindful of is having as many channels as you possibly can. Because, you know, still today, we're seeing property managers who solely depend on Airbnb for demand generation. And for me, in terms of valuation, a business like that has no valuation. Why? Because it's solely dependent on one source channel and the pandemic has shown if that tap is turned off, there's no more demand and you're done, right? So I think we need to be mindful of that. Any guest who comes from an OTA, you have the chance to convert it into a direct booking as well. So you need to have a CRM strategy at the same time as well. What yeah. would you say to people who say, oh, well, I increase my prices on the on the OTAs in accordance with the commission they charge me anyway, so it doesn't affect me, right? Well, that's a myth, right? I mean, we still have, we also need to be mindful of meta search companies like a Holidu and a home to go where it shows a lot of transparency. So we need to be very careful with that strategy of uplifting commissions onto our sell price. 
you know, not even talked about price parity. You know, we have not seen OTAs enforcing price parity when it comes to that, but it could potentially get to that as well. So we need to be very mindful. Um, I think it's more about to think about how do we structure our contract with our own homeowners and how we can get a more transparent. So for me, it's not an uplift uh, discussion, Kyle, in, in, in a lot of sense. That you react that way makes perfect sense because you you want to sort of absorb that that commission of a third party distribution because you want to sell it higher, right? But your conversion will come down incredibly as well. The consumer spends hours and hours on many platforms on before he makes his booking, so you know he's he's going to be very mindful of that uh, obviously as well. So I think that's something we, you need to be very careful about. I think it's more how you structure your contract towards your owner and how you allocate the commission of the different channels. And I think that's something that could help you to sort of circumvent uh, marking up prices to your direct prices. Very good. Well, that's certainly something we, we're going to touch on in a, in a later point. Uh, I think the third tip uh, is to put profitability first. Obviously, it seems like a, an obvious tip, so I wondered if you had perhaps a, a concrete case that you could perhaps take us through and, and sort of demonstrate that. Certainly, let me uh, let me share my uh, my screen with you, uh, and I will show you, of course, um, a customer of um, of uh, Avantio, um, who we were able to make an analysis of APS. Um, just to start with, this particular customer. This is a case study we have prepared for this conversation today. Um, this customer is Feeling Italy. It's a vacation rental company on the Amalfi Coast with 64 properties, 44 apartments, 20 villas. And, and, um, and we've been able to analyze with APS their profitability, right? The study has shown us, so we go to a unit level. Let's remember that again. So we go onto a unit level and differentiate between the revenues that are generated and the costs that are generated by the booking with the occupancy that they had in a normal year, obviously. And, and what are the ADRs, which is cost uh, uh, by, divided by night or turned by night, and how many nights are booked? So we wanted to find out how many nights does this company need to reach profitability based on its inventory and on a unit level. This is important here. We're looking at it on a unit level and not just saying we have 100 units, these are my costs, I'm profitable. We want to find out which properties of your inventory are actually not profitable based on its occupancy, but also based on the cost that are associated to the unit based on the variable costs. Because one thing that certain property managers or a lot of property managers don't take into consideration are unit densities. Because if units are far apart from each other, you have longer drive time, you have maybe higher cleaning costs. So we need to, that needs to be done to actually see, in this particular case, we find that 10 properties generated negative contribution. So they were not reaching profitability. So you need to go deeper into it. So, the, and, 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 you know, for customers um, who want to come and, and work with us, we are more than willing, uh, obviously, to go deeper into a study and show you some additional figures. But without going into too much detail in this particular case here, we, we would like to show you um, um, some of the, 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 at the actual conclusion before and after uh, we actually used APS. So we can see profitability per unit. We see profitability uh, versus revenue. We see the units that are not profitable. So on the right, you see the ones who are not having a positive contribution. You see the other ones on the left that are actually producing a positive contribution. And then we want to look at this at the whole business. So we identify a lot of different um, issues. So let me go uh, a bit further to say, okay, what does it need? How, what's the break even point? How many nights do I need on a property level for it to become profitable? And that's fantastic to understand. So here we, we have this profitability line, obviously neutralized to show the, the, this slide shows before we applied APS and looked at the cost structure and made this allocation, we realized 
that when you start at the revenue zero, you already obviously have costs because these are your fixed costs. And then the business grows. So here you see the revenue line and the cost line crossing at exactly 8,007 nights. So with that portfolio, I need 8,007 nights to be profitable according to my cost allocation. That again, does not mean we need to be profitable on all units. Then you see the cost revenue ratio, which here is 98%, which results in an overall profitability of 4%. So when you then start looking at your fixed costs, your variable costs, your unprofitable units that you might not even need in your inventory, despite the fact that you, of course, are going to lose revenue because they're not generating revenue for anymore, but it's actually better for you not to have them. It shows you here, after cleaning the costs out, doing a proper cost allocation and the analysis, it shows us our profitable point has come down from 8,007 nights to actually 6,400. So we can be profitable already at 6,400 nights and the cost revenue ratio has come down 12% down to 86% and your profit margin has therefore increased by 11%. So might as well your revenue might come down, maybe your unit count, count come down overall, but not necessarily because you can also address costs. But this is what APS comes out as a result across the entire portfolio. And this is how, and we analyze that on a unit level. And we take a lot of different things into consideration. We look at unit type, size, quality, unit density, etc. So it's not just unit in itself we go a lot deeper in setting attributes for your inventory as well yeah, yeah i think simon this analysis is crucial in order to make to to make a strategy uh, along the, of your company if you don't have these uh, these figures perhaps you 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 don't have the control of your business so so i no, uh, this is something very much missing manuel sorry to interrupt you but that's a very good point we talk about kpis you know we see very sophisticated companies and and I'm sure a lot of you uh, in the audience have heard how, how Sykes Cottages looks at their business. I mean, they're, they're, they're rock stars uh, with, the, with the unit economics that how they drive their business. They know they know it down to individual users on, on each uh, device, where they book, how they book, what time they book, what's the gender. So, I mean, Sykes for me is the benchmark in the way they generate direct demand and running a business by a KPI. But that's not necessary. I mean, Sykes is a different league. Uh, it's highly profitable and is, is doing an amazing job. So, so I have a lot of respect. But being a property manager, I think it's important. We're going a little bit deeper in understanding some key KPIs, key performance indicators which are important for you to understand and make the right decision for your business. You know, a lot of cases, Manuel, we have customers, um, when we do the deep dive uh, uh, strategy analysis, we look at their revenue management. And I'm going, I'm having always a meeting with the revenue manager in the company. And then I sit down with him and I say, you know, show me what you do. And then he sets prices for a weekend and, and whatever. And then I say, do you know if that particular price on that property is going to bring your business a positive contribution? Is that going to be a profitable price? And he will look at me in 100% of the cases and says, I have no idea. Because I, I just see that demand is low, so I'm lowering rates. And then I say to him, you might be better off not renting that place for that weekend because he actually gives you a negative contribution. And then the argument from the CEO comes, yeah, but we have to because we need to create revenue for the owners. And say, well, then speak to the owners and put the facts on the table and show them that, share your insights. And this is what APS is helping you to do, to be transparent to the owner and say, dear owner, we love to generate some revenue for you, but on these prices, we can't have a positive contribution. So we rather leave that house empty for the weekend because if it's booked, we're not making money. And this helps us to the point that I raised earlier to actually not be reduced to become glorified cleaning people, which is the statement I made at the Vacation Rental World Summit in 2019, we should be proud of what we're doing. But homeowners need to understand what we do to be a professional operator. And therefore, there's nothing wrong in sharing some detail with the homeowners and telling them what you actually do on a daily basis to run a profitable business. And I think every homeowner understands that we need to make profits in order to exist, right? So yeah, that yeah, should yeah. help. 
I think you are, you are right. As long as you have these figures, you can put it in the table and, and show them to the property, to the owner, and then have a discussion about that and say, we have to, we have to renegotiate our contract. We have to do some changes. So, so I think it's, it's, it's crucial to have, to, have this, to, to have these figures in order to manage your inventory. You know, on that one with the contracts quickly, I think it's important that we're taking a hybrid approach. It's, there is not one size fits all because the owner today has become more sophisticated and understands his options. So we need to be transparent and we need to give our homeowners choice when we contract with them. In terms of the services we provide, in terms of the contracts we provide, there's not one size fits all anymore in the vacation rental industry. I, I, I can say that I had a great conversation with Graham today. We haven't spoken for a while, uh, CEO of Sykes, and he agrees. He's like, we need to have a more hybrid approach here, right? Yeah, yeah. Perhaps with, with a flexible approach, you can be more profitable because you have more options. And yeah. That's more options also. Yes, and um, I suppose on that point, uh, lot, I would say the vast majority of, of property managers, they tend to have sort of one flat rate, let's say, or what, almost a one size fits all approach, you know. Uh, our commission is this all year round, which surprises me really, because depending on where you are, of course, if you're in an urban market, it might make sense if your occupancy is, is higher all year round, but surely if, if you're in a seasonal uh, location, then bookings are harder to come by in certain points of the year, and, and you're having to effectively higher your costs, inv invest more in, in, in gaining bookings. So, I mean, is there an argument that property managers should be looking at, at as you said, being more flexible and, and being more creative, let's say, with the agreements that they, they have with the owners, you know? Absolutely, Kyle. I mean, I can even go back a little bit further and say, hey, if you don't start professionalizing your business, you'll be eaten up, okay? Because let us not forget, COVID is giving us a, a lifetime opportunity to grow massively in this sector. So times are good for the vacation rental industry. But what an IPO at Airbnb has done, it will attract a lot more players in this market who are smart, fast, coming from the hospitality space, are super bright people, and not just running a lifestyle vacation rental company and think it's fun to do. They're great to have. And this is why, you know, we have so old businesses already in Europe. It's going to get tough. And for that reason, we need to be more flexible. So to your point, this is a commercial approach. If you go out with a flat commission across a year, you will be taken over because somebody else who realizes, hey, I have shoulder seasons, I have off seasons, I have high seasons. I want to do a, a stronger approach on revenue share with my owner. I want him be part in the low season, I'm happy to share revenue with him in the high season, you need to have a flexible commission approach because then that allows you to be far more variable in terms of the ADRs you can charge because he will tell you, look, in winter, I'm okay with 500 euros a week. Okay, go for it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is blocked today. This is why a lot of, because the demand will increase. That's, what, that's what's happening. So either Meta, either Google, Meta Search, OTAs, and direct bookings, demand will increase. We haven't even talked about future demand from Southeast Asia. We haven't even, you know, all that is coming on top. And let us not forget, vacation rental is only used by 40% of our travelers. So we still have 60% of people who are not rented yet, who we also need to address. So therefore we need to improve, professionalize our approach also towards owner and be flexible and commissions and, and commission models and contracting and shoulder season commission models, flexible pricing is definitely one of them that we have to adapt to. Because if you just go out and say, I want an exclusive contract, I want 48 weeks availability at 35% margin, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen anymore. It's very tough. Yeah, and you touched on the demand. Uh, I suppose the same is, is true with the supply as well. I mean, the supply in general, I suppose, has taken a, a dive, a, a drop during COVID. Lots of customers, lots of owners have had to put their homes back on a long-term module or model, let's say. But one assumes when the good times do return, you know, there's going to be an increased uh supply on the market those properties will come back on the market and you know they'll be up for up for grabs they'll be uh, looking to to host with someone and they'll have plenty of offers you'll have uh, plenty of competition for those properties and as you say you know it's 
it's being competitive, isn't it? It's it's perhaps offering things that others aren't and, and, and differentiating yourselves as well in that way. No, absolutely. I think we need to be ready for the growth of the more supply coming to market. I mean, let's face it, if people like it to hear it or not, but we will also find, we will see ourselves in some very challenging times commercially going forward. You know, what has happened here with COVID and the unemployment will have aftermath. Uh, you know, Manuel and I surely remember the financial crisis in Spain in 2008. I mean, banks were calling me saying, hey, take that inventory off my hands. You know, prices in Costa Blanca dropped by 400%. It was crazy. And that supply came in. And I think more supply will come to market, without a doubt. People who will want to rent have to rent. So, you know, we still we always talk about how many companies are, are renting or how many buildings are renting. It's actually more not rented still today. And there will be more supply. And we need to be professionally how we manage that. And, and supply is, is for sure coming. But the demand... And the customer experience will be equally heavy on us. So we need to be mindful of the cost to operate it and, and everything mindful that we're doing within this business, right? Okay, okay very good. Yes, got to be mindful of the CAC. Um, okay, well, uh, let's move on to the next tip then, uh, which is uh, fairly obvious, I would, I would suggest, but uh, reducing your operating costs sounds obvious, but how, how can people do that, you know? And um, what would you say is a sort of a healthy balance between, you know, having your own internal contracted fixed costs or having sort of external service providers who are not sort of contracted to you, who are not fixed Absolutely. costs? So here we have the exactly the same approach in how we deal with owners. It's a hybrid approach, right? There's not one size fits all. You know, we know property managers who outsource everything, even call center and cleaning and everything is outsourced. And if it's outsourced, in most cases, it's actually totally variable, which is fantastic, right? Obviously, if it's in source, a lot of it is fixed. And I think, again, depending on the volume, depending on your seasonality, depending on many aspects, you need to find the right balance. And depending on your size, I think you always need certain cleaning people, cleaning staff inside because they're very vulnerable. They're actually the most important to you in terms of quality execution. Let's not forget cleanliness is still one of the major complaint points in vacation rental. And we need to master that. So you totally outsourcing, you will never master that. Uh, so you need people who understand, who can train, who can make spot checks. They, are, they need to live and breathe your business to make sure you maintain these standards. And then you have external for peaks, uh, et cetera. So you can break your seasonal peaks with externals. The same in call centers. You know, you, if you have a call center, yes, have some base people there that you can sort of utilize the entire year around. And if there's more demand, there's options. You know, you have virtual agents. I, I consult a lot of business in the US. They use virtual agents in the Philippines and in India, and they work fantastically well. They're super trained. They yep. use standard operating procedures. They're 24 seven available. It's a good cost. And then there's many other things. I think it just helps. I mean, this is a, a healthy process going through APS because it, it forces you or your finance manager, your team to go with our guys through line items by line items on your cost. And cost is not just reducing people. There's many others. You know, when have you last negotiated your cleaning contract? When have you last negotiated your laundry contract? How do you get your bed linen? Is it leased? Is it owned? You know, what is your turnover with, with that cost? How many, how many, one thing that is, is very crucial, track cost towards an owner. How many property managers are absorbing costs that are actually should be paid by owners? It's amazing, you know? There's broken glasses, there's broken dishes, you need to replace those. And the property managers say, ah, we'll just do it so we don't bother the owner. Hey, this is, this is, this is something that needs to work. Insurances is another one. People can insure themselves for damages which they covered today. It will reduce your cost. So I think the list, Kyle, is endless, but it's important that you're doing, you're, you're making a, a, an 80 20 list, which means you need to look at 80% of your cost that generates, you know, 20% of your impact in, in terms of your profitability, and, and then address those. And you'll be amazed what, what you can actually do if you do a proper cost control at least once a year, if not twice.
Mm -hmm. No, presumably you uh, take all of that into consideration when you're doing your analysis, right? You you look at every sort of outgoing, every you take that all into consideration. I mean, once you calculate the check-in and a check-out cost, mm. and then you start to think about, hey, I might be better off using a house automation tool to get rid of that. Because then it's the best of customer experience. And we all know it's no secret. During COVID, nobody wants to be checked in in person. Just sent me a, a code of my house and I go there myself on my mobile phone, I can open it. I mean, all of a sudden, the person who drives there with the scooter and the key doesn't need to do that anymore. Maybe he can do something else more productive, more profitable. And, you know, house automation is for sure one. Operation software, you know, uh, scheduling people. Um, so there's... There's technology available also through uh, Avanti, of course, but there's add-ons like Internet of Things, which you can improve and you can reduce costs. For example, you know, if you can control an air conditioning in a Spanish villa, you know, how much of your costs are going to come down? Some of them are, are, are born by the operators if they're not mm -hmm. passed on to the guests, right? So there's so much you can do to reduce your overall costs. Yeah, it's a... Uh... As you say, um, we have quite a few technological partners in our marketplace now, and they can do weird and wonderful things. They can measure the level of carbon dioxide so that they know Absolutely. when the guest has left. Noise control. Like, <laughs> yeah. Every so you can uh, prepare the property earlier, automatically send a message to the guest. Would you like to check in earlier? It will only cost you X, Y, Z, all of these sorts of things, you know? Yeah, that's a, so you can even add revenue. So we don't need to just mm. talk about cost all the time because you can add revenue too, right? Mm. Yeah. Perfect. That uh, takes us to the, the last tip, but perhaps one of the most important one, that's to review your business model and owner contracts at least once per year. It's, it's very important to, to have this into account because... And we have to establish a win-win relationship with our owners. We have uh, to win both. That, that's very important. Owners have to value our service and give us a, a reasonable margin. And if not, uh, business is not going to work. So this is this is very important, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely, Manuel. And, and that sort of brings me to the previous points I raised, right? I think to start off with is what I said before. You know, we need this equal symbiosis between guests and owners. That's that's so important for property managers. If you guest heavy, you have a high churn rate because owners come and go. If you if you're if you're if you're owner heavy, you know, it, it will result in guest complaints because you favor the owner in many aspects and, and whatever. And I think to live this symbiosis is very difficult and it's challenging. But what it means, you know, if we if you go to property managers and ask them what is my what is your two biggest pain points? Uh, pain point number one is tech, which is great for Avantio. Uh, and pain point number two is dealing with homeowners, right? Because, yeah, yeah. you know, the fact that we're dealing in an industry that is 98% of its supply are second homes is not going to go away. So at large, we will never see big institutional real estate owners who run 500 villas and own them. That's not going to happen. It will never happen. In urban space, yes, of course, uh, you will have people who buy inventory, own inventory, manage inventory. But to think about it, so we so we said earlier, we're, we're not glorified cleaning people. So we agree with that. We're a lot better than that. But actually, we are asset managers. So think about this. It's that's, that's sexy in a way, right? We're asset managers. We're managing someone else's asset. And that person, for him, that's his castle because... With his first big paycheck, he was able to finally buy a house in Spain, which he was dreaming about for 20 years. And that's his one and only. So that's something we need to understand. And then we need to go and sit down with him and be flexible on the contracting side. And you need to review contracts because owners' perception are changing. They're educating themselves as well. They say, well, they're getting too much from me or whatever. And we need to be transparent. So APS helps you to create the transparency in this conversation. And the result of that is we need to be flexible in how we approach owners. So if an owner doesn't want to give you um, a full service exclusive contract, well, then start with distribution only. Take it on board and say, hey, I can do a good job for you. I'll do distribution for you. And if you like it, I, I will also manage it for you. And then hopefully exclusively after a while. You can be flexible on the commission model you're applying, saying, hey, 
give me an, a gross margin that I need for my business and we add the distribution on, on top, you know, because the more flexible you are with your owner, the more quick you can react to certain demand and supply uh, changes that are happening. Because we're being so static, if something happens like a COVID, which is obviously one of the biggest things since the Second World War that has hit this world, and um, we have, a lot of people have not been able to react very well and very fast, right? Because they didn't have that flexibility. They didn't have that contractual flexibility. Then the website was in the wrong language because they only attracted Germans. And all of a, a sudden you need a, a web page in Catalan and in Spanish to address local customers in Spain. That has helped us and that needs flexibility. So it's towards the owner as well. And then you can say to the owner, you know what I just did? I just translated my website into Spanish. Wow. You know, we do all that to generate demand, but we need to include that into the conversation of our homeowners. And I'm, I'm sure they understand and they will give you the, the, the necessary flexibility for you to run a profitable business. Yeah, Simon, I agree. You have to, uh, to include the, the owners in your marketing plan because you have to do marketing with them. And then um, one suggestion I will make, for example, is to um, give value to the service you provide, even if they are free. And um, because um, I think there's a lot of services we do for the owners, like, for example, a home inspection, opening the door for a handyman, for example. And um, you have to show this to the owner, the services you are providing them. For example, in the Avantio software, uh, you, can, you can register all these services and then they will appear in the owner's portal and in the settlements. So the owners will know what you are doing for them, even if, if it's for free. But they'll have a, like a, a, check, a, a list of 20 services you are giving them. For them. Even the cancellations, right? Even the cancellations, yes. That's right. I mean, that's that's an amazing one. The owner says, I have no revenue. Yeah, but sorry, we had a hundred cancellations, right? right. Ah, you had bookings. Yeah. Say, well, you know, if the people can't travel, I mean, we've done our jobs. But that's that's extremely important. Yeah, and suddenly In fact, it's... the owner is aware of what million things are doing for, for the property that they don't know. And, and they, they realize that your margin of 30, 40% is a fair margin. But if you don't have this transparency with him, you, don't, you, you cannot market uh, your services, your company. So this, I think, is very important. Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we're, uh, what, we've been going now for about 40, 45 minutes. So uh, let's turn it over to Nicole then and see uh, what questions we've got uh, from the audience. Still time to, to add a question if you'd like to ask Simon anything or anyone else. Yes. Nicole? Yes, thank you, Kyle, and thank you so much, and Simon and, and Manuel. We, yeah, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, so we have the first one from Roberto. He says, if you reduce personal costs, which is the largest expense, and you're looking at external services, external call centers, it affects direct customer service, and many times it is contrary to the final feeling of customer care and service. How would you solve it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> I have uh, at Interhome, we have centralized our call center to Prague and we have closed nine country, uh, nine country uh, operations in the individual markets to actually cap um, the, the, the seasonality of the business. And we needed to build a call center from scratch uh, in a different country um, to, to be 24 seven. So we had a lot of benefits because all of a sudden, you're able to do operate 24 seven, which you can never do before. If you only have three people in one location and five people in another and nine in another. Uh, so we were able to reduce costs um, dramatically, but then the quality starts to harm immediately because, because it's hard to sort of put the, the right feel and touch uh, to these people. I think number one, it really depends what kind of contracts you're setting up. Number two is how, how you include that team into the organization. So we had an outsourced company that we built from scratch, but we had these people coming to our destination every year, at least once a week. So they were able to get a house, come and stay with us, be part of the family, understand what vacation rental is all about, make them part of it. I mean, this is something that I urge anybody to do anyway. 
that's a, like we we call that learning by doing which at interhome we had the rule that each executive each staff had to go one week to do something totally different to what they normally do so the guys who were on the call they had to do property management acquisition with the owners so they hear the complaints from the owners then the you know the cfo who was complaining about the high cost had to run an operation for a week in the destination i went to go and help cleaning i went to help key handling I, I was exposed to complaints that came in. So we, we put our call center part of it. That means you need to have good standard operating procedures and you need to have very good service level agreements, SLAs with your service provider and make them feel part of that. And this is why I'm saying, you know, don't outsource everything. Maybe you, you can retain one person in your organization who is in charge of that, who breathes the quality and the DNA of your company to make sure your service providers are adhering to that. It, you know, it's always a trade-off. Yes, it is. And trust me, the people in the company will always complain that your service provider will never do the better job than you do internally. That's something you need to get, you need to accept because it's a commercial decision. But I think there's many ways in how you can manage uh, relations, even to third-party providers. I mean, you can even give you know, for example, a cleaning team who has a good review, give them a bottle of champagne, even if it's a third party provider, they will they will make sure this place is clean again the next time. So there is there is ways in how you can deal with third party, even that they're not way of your part of the company. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I know I have a customer who's a, a big, big fan of the gig economy and they do exactly that. Simon, you get a five star review on Airbnb. OK, you get a bonus. Exactly. And you can do that in the sales team as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And also, um, also from Roberto, he wonders when you uh, request uh, AGL to do an analysis, what data do you, do you guys need for, for that analysis? How, how long does it take to complete the job? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Roberto. And that's the hard, that's definitely a tough part. So that really depends and hopefully on the quality of data that we can have access to. So so you know, we can go the deeper we can go, the better it is for us. And maybe that's a, a, a good issue you're raising here, Roberto, in general in the vacation rental industry. And unfortunately, with a lot of operators we have worked with in different jurisdictions in the world the data quality in terms of finance is not to the level where it really should be to run a business. I mean, in a lot of cases, I would not run a business on that basis. It's too dangerous, right? So, so you need to have a high uh, approach to quality in terms of financial data. Uh, and we need financial data. So we need access. Uh, we need a dump of your financial data that we can then attribute to the different uh, cost drivers. So we need a, a yearly PNL that we can then allocate uh, to, to, to the units. Then we need obviously access uh, to the PMS because we need booking data uh, as well. And, and, and that's about it. And then the algorithm is done manually. So let's not forget APS is still a manual consulting service that is supported by a massive algorithm that sits on an Excel spreadsheet. So we are actually feeding that Excel spreadsheet. Plus we take the daily pickup from the difference from the day before in terms of bookings and occupancy, and then cal and then adds the financial costs to the algorithm once we have done the allocation. And then we, we create that report on a daily basis, on a, on a manual basis. So time frame, you know, it really depends on our customers, how ready they are in terms of providing that data to us. Um, we can react pretty quickly if we have access to the right tools. The PMS is definitely one of them. And the accounting is another, or you do a data dump on a CSV or whatever. Um, and then we can analyze that data, but then we can we can be pretty fast and, and, and have the first reports to you uh, in, 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 a reasonable, in a reasonable time. But I would say on average, about two or three months. And this is a, if I may interrupt, this is a service that you offer in, in multiple languages, right? It's not just English. Yeah, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's the service you offer in the languages that we speak. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the advantage of AGL because our guys speak French, German, Italian, English, and even Swiss German. Uh, that's a great advantage. So, so we can basically cater in these languages. Uh, we can, Italian is important, obviously, in, in Italy. Spanish is important. French is important. And then German and English, so we can cover these languages. Yeah. 
Okay, and, and uh, also the question is, do you fix those errors afterwards? Do you, do you maintain uh, periodic reviews? <laughs> yeah, that's control? a great question. <laughs> well, we, we'll be more than happy to. So that's, so that's an interesting point, you know, and maybe I'm, I'm allowed to share that uh, very personal feedback. But when I, when I talked with uh, Manuel about this partnership, I asked him, you know, why, why do you want to do that? With, with AGL and, and hopefully Manuel, you don't mind why I'm sharing that with the audience. But Manuel said to me, you know, what I like is that you're human beings and you're not machines. So therefore it's not just a software you plug in and it shows you some results. It's actually AGL, the experience that I bring in my team adds the salt and the pepper to the result, right? Because otherwise you can plug in any type of data analytics tool and it spits something out of you and you're not smarter afterwards. So this is why we're combining APS with a consulting service because we can help you implement those because we've done it. We have operated units, we have operated vacation rentals. We know what it means. We know each and every cost driver. And let us not forget something here. We need to simplify a little bit because at the end of the day, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody in the audience, but we're co connecting owners with guests. It's not rocket science. So cost structure, operation, no matter if you're in Australia, in Mexico, in, in Kuala Lumpur, in Dubai, in the US, it's the same. Okay, you might have some other tourist tax, you might have some other taxation levels, but at the end of the day, the business is exactly the same, has the same drivers, you need to check in, you need to check out, you need to clean, you need to operate. So we help definitely. And that's, that's where the, the, the flexibility of the customer is a big question as well, because you know they might wanna hear it, but they, they, they might not wanna do it. So uh, we obviously have that as well, that we can show very quickly where your pain points are and which units they are. And we can definitely help you with building new uh, owner contracts, uh, you know, how you be more flexible with that. We can help you how to do an RFP for a cleaning company. Say, okay, we'll help you. RFP means request for proposal. You know, some companies have, a, have cleaning contracts with two, 300 units, have not even negotiated that for three years. I like and then all of a sudden they can reduce their cost by 20% because they do a proper uh, tender uh, that they need to pitch for. And then all of a sudden the costs come down. So yes, we can help, but it's a, it's a teamwork for sure. Absolutely, Simon, I agree with you. Um, a machine uh, can never uh, study a contract and, and, and can never talk with you and interact with you. And at the end, I think this can be compatible both both worlds you can have a a machine doing some some things some routine things but you can have also a consultant that can uh, manage the strategy so i think both both worlds both worlds can convert and perhaps the best solution is to have both uh, some software to do the routine things the price the pricing the the, the changes in the price etc so you don't have to do manually but perhaps there is a consultant in, in the back that says, hey, you are going to the right strategy, you don't do that, you have to do that. So I think I think AGL is a, is a fantastic service and recommend it. Thank you so much. And this, you know, this is why we rebranded the business from AGL uh, Consulting to AGL Atelier, because actually we are, we're an atelier of several different tools in how we can help. I've been a CEO for 30 years. I have people experience because a lot of cost reduction issues are related to staff because the reaction will, hey, that's the always the way we've done it and we'll continue to do that. So we know that there's roadblocks with the human capital as well. So we have that sensitivity. It takes me a day to be in a property manager's company to understand the pain points within the business because it's, it's humans and this is what we love about it, right? But then we take technology to go deeper and helps us to to, to understand and, 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 and maybe structure it better as an output. But then when the output is there, then you need to have human capital again to actually activate the changes that you need to implement, right? And the machine is not gonna take care of that for no. sure. No, <laughs> I agree. Okay, and we have, thank you uh, so much, Simon. And here we also have another question from Andy Osborne. Um, specifically talking about Brexit, you say supply of properties will increase, but with Brexit, Brexit we are seeing less properties. 
as the owners can no longer take off expenses and pay full tax on the money received from us. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a very individual point uh, that we have mm -hmm. interesting enough just today yeah. have discussed with Graham Donahue as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, talking about an internationalization strategy, we had a lot of Brits own units in the, in the EU, and then all of a sudden they can't offset them from a tax, tax standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, actually, it's going to be a regulatory issue as well. You know, I think that's an immediate effect, Andy, to, to say the least. I mean, even with regulatory issues, we see things balancing itself out. If that is in real estate prices, other people will pick up the units, the units will become available for rent, even if the owner demographics are changing within a, within a destination as well. I mean, I obviously don't have an immediate answer, but it's definitely something you need to be mindful, especially if you're in a destination which is very, let's say, Brit heavy uh, from a from a demand standpoint, but also from an owner demographic standpoint, but then you need to take that into consideration and then you know look at markets where are more you know German heavy demand or French heavy demand, or uh, or other uh, geographies uh, where you can build uh, assets where if, if the supply is, is 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 starting to drop, but you know if if an impact like that drop supply, then supply will become available even more so potentially, because maybe the banks will end up with these assets and, the, and they don't want to sit on it. So, you know, I think there's always alternatives to be sure, you know, how to understand how the owner demographics are changing and how you can address that uh, uh, with individual homeowners and how markets can potentially shift. I mean, let's remember when the, when the low cost carriers came into the game and started to fly to Spain. I mean, they just populated areas within within years, just building an airport, flying people there, and all of a sudden it, the market is available. And I think we will see in this phenomena going forward, but maybe with different consumers and different own demographics as well. Yeah, I think also, um, Simon, there is a fiscal issue here because uh, non-EU cannot deduct uh, the expenses. Correct. Uh, so, so, but perhaps we have a solution. We have uh, some clients that have uh, uh, came up with a solution, and we can we can talk with Andy in private and perhaps give give him some tips about it. Great. Okay, Any more so questions, Nicole? So I'm seeing here. Uh, see if there's anyone else writing. Everyone, uh, there's just a couple of minutes to go. So go ahead and ask any questions through the chat. Okay. No, so far we don't have any more questions. Okay. 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 Okay, well, if there's no uh, speak now or forever hold your peace, but um, whilst <laughs> we've got the last couple of minutes, um, how can people contact you, Simon? What's the best way to get hold of you and, and speak to you and, and, uh, and find out a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be obviously more than delighted. I mean, it's not an easy process and you need to be uh, willing to, uh, to to go through an interesting exercise together with us. It will help the team. It will help you to understand um, what profitability is all about uh, and, and what you can do about that because it will provide you a super clear structure uh, on your on your operation and, and then help you to, to execute that. It's actually a very good team exercise because it makes a lot of people very aware of what cost drivers are, how, are they, how they're dealt with and, and what can every person uh, contribute to actually um, make the business uh, even more profitable. You know, we had a we had an example in a Spanish operation in a city where guests were allowed to leave their luggage behind in the office, but it was a distracting and it didn't create any revenue. So I said, forget that. You know, people leaving luggage in your office and it's distracting for the staff. Give that to one of the stashers or the luggage hero guys. Make a ref share agreement. And, and outsource that. And, and sure enough, they solved a huge problem on one hand. And, and, and secondly, they made more money with it. So, you know, we have a lot of these exercises and, and understanding because we're doing this on a daily basis. So HL Atelier is uh, actually very easy to find. So Simon Lehman on, on LinkedIn, um, definitely you find hlatelier.com. 
uh, uh, is our website where you can register, you can contact us. Uh, we have a team in Barcelona uh, that you can also find under HL Atelier in, uh, in, on LinkedIn, which is uh, Ezio Albanese and Nicolas Calantini and, uh, and now also our latest member, Katie Glover. Um, so I think LinkedIn is definitely the best page to find us on. Uh, and also we will, we will write uh, to all the participants of this course. You, you will be provided uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a pitch presentation and APS and its technology with all our contact details on it as well. That is right. And I'm also sorry. I've also uh, for everyone. I've left a link in the chat where you can actually have a form where you can contact the team, just to let everyone know. There's also a special discount of, uh, I think, an offer, ten percent for the first exactly. Yes. Five subscribers. Yes, that's right. So, so it's important to be quick and subscribe soon. Yeah. First Absolutely. five subscribers get a ten percent discount. Five. Correct. So because it's so much work and it's very intensive for everyone, we, we want to be mindful. So for the first five subscribers uh, to APS services, we'll get a 10% discount. So, and basically the way we calculate the pricing on APS is depending on the unit count that you have. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank uh, Avantio, Manuel, uh, Kyle and Nicole and the entire team for putting things together, uh, fantastic. At the same time, I wanna congratulate you for being uh, nominated as the best PMS at the Shorties Award in 2021. I had the honor to be a judge there myself and, uh, and uh, going through uh, different categories. Unfortunately, PMS was not one of my categories to judge, uh, but uh, congratulations. We're very looking forward as AGL to partner with Avantio and I hope it's only the good start of a great relationship uh, going forward. We were very enthusiastic of building a great partnership with you and, and, and your customer and hopefully adding a lot of value to help uh, lifting professionalism in this industry and help everybody to become profit profitable as well. Fantastic, Simon. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it would be a great service for clients and you, uh, you have a, a fantastic um, uh, product to offer. So I expect um, a bright future and a lot of success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Well, I'll sign off then and say once again, thank you to Simon for joining us. And thank, thank you, you very much for taking the time to tune in today.